during the Bangladesh cyclone disasters of the 90s, of the 140,000 people who died, 90% of them were women and children. Warnings about the cyclones were verbally passed from male to male in public areas where women weren't present and even aware of what was happening. The restrictive social statuses of Bangladeshi women impeded their ability to stay safe and make planned and practical decisions. Many women were trapped indoors, caring for their children or for the elderly, simply waiting for a man to return and tell them where to go. If anything is to be learned from that 90%, it is that when you deprive a woman of the tools that she needs to keep herself safe, you are depriving an entire family from being safe. When a society constructs how a woman should behave, it makes it difficult for her to reach beyond that box. And when disaster strikes, where do women turn? What do they do if not equipped with the right tools to keep themselves and others safe or even the knowledge of an approaching disaster. Globally, women and children are 14% more likely to die in a natural disaster than men. And this is true in countries whose cultures restrict women within the domestic sector of society. While women and girls tend to be inside when disaster strikes, men are outside and have the advantages of knowing how to swim or climb trees. And this leaves women extremely vulnerable. And it is the reason that they are three and a half times more likely to drown in a flood when compared to men. Now, for many Americans, we're pretty lucky because we get to learn how to swim at a young age. But for girls in communities that face tsunamis and hurricanes that don't have this privilege, something we tend to take for granted, it's a matter between life and death. And even though they may be exposed to consistent natural disasters like tsunamis and hurricanes, many girls are shamed for their desire to learn what boys are expected to know. Natural disasters leave everyone in their path vulnerable to the loss of a normal lifestyle, to their livelihood, but women are often led in that direction when societal norms allow inequalities to take control. Now, regardless of gender, there are three traditional impacts that all natural disaster victims can face. They include the loss of life, home, and material goods. And while women face these traditional impacts, many face secondary ones, such as violence, a deterioration of reproductive and general health, and an increased state of poverty. And some may also experience changes in their physical and emotional well-being and self-perception, one change extremely common among young girls. And these secondary impacts are all referred to as double disasters. And the reason that double disasters exist is because an exposure to risk is largely connected to the assets that a person has. So if a woman has limited assets, she then has a larger vulnerability to the economic, physical, and emotional deterioration brought on by a disaster. And not only is she forced to brace those added impacts, she will most likely not have the resources to help pull her up when a society or a disaster pushes them down. Because women tend to have the least amount of access to resources when compared to males, yet they face this added layer of vulnerability and loss. And within this second layer rests GBV, a term for gender-based violence. GBV is exacerbated in natural disasters. It is the reason that one in three women will experience some form of physical or sexual abuse in her lifetime. GBV rises when people are left out of control of their lives and lacking the things that they need to survive or feel comfortable. 
factors like stress, insecurity, and tension lead to rape being used as a tactic to gain control and power over someone vulnerable. But a difference in biology is not what makes women more vulnerable than men. It is the gendered power relations that remain in use and in full force, controlling the values and the actions of people across the world, and even in our own country. 2005. It's the year some will remember for the founding of YouTube, or for George W. Bush's second term as US president. But many will remember 2005 as the year that Hurricane Katrina devastated the nation. New Orleans was hit especially hard, the rebuilding and recovery process still requiring the nation's attention today. The Mercedes Superdome, which houses the New Orleans Saints and Jazz, quickly became a home to over 20,000 displaced people. Overnight, conditions in the, in the Superdome turned from crowded to inhumane as killings, rapes, suicides, drug abuse, and unsanitary living conditions became a new reality for Katrina's victims. Some called it an arena of suffering facing yet another type of storm inside of the shelter that was meant to protect them. An estimated 63% of rapes go unreported. So for experiences like those in Katrina, little quantitative evidence is available to support the stories that we hear, sometimes even the stories that we tell, and turn them into irrefutable facts. And a lack of data makes it difficult for us to examine the long-term effects that natural disasters can specifically have on women. But something we do have is the present. The information and data being collected just as a hurricane is coming in. And all of these findings show us that gender inequality is not just present in politics or in the workplace, but that it's present in natural disasters, human-made disasters, in climate change, and in the actions and repercussions of the environment and of humans. But even so, even when we acknowledge its existence, it's present in our everyday lives, from here to across the world, why are we not speaking about it? Why are women repeatedly left out of the conversation when the conversation should really be about them. We need to put an end to the questions and improve the odds of survival for women, therefore improving the odds of survival for everyone. We need to allow women to be the ones to lead emergency response work. We need to prepare them and train them in disaster preparation to have them develop their leadership skills so that they can be the ones to guide their communities through the stages of recovery, allowing young girls to one day follow in their path. Because just like women, if a society has limited their assets by not equipping both genders with the right tools, the right knowledge, then that society is more vulnerable to face economic mobilization due to natural disasters. So saving women is not just a way to save lives. It is a way to save a community and ensure an easier path towards recovery. We must stop restricting women within a box, expecting them to come out of it alive and well after experiencing tornadoes, flooding, tsunamis, rape, and abuse. We need to cast aside the boxes that society puts us in at such a young age. And we must take advantage of the power of conversation, including everyone, regardless of our genders, for one common goal, to save lives. Thank you.